Hello. Uh, welcome to Roll Call. My name is Kayla McNabb. I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I will be your host for this afternoon. Uh, we are here to talk about a one shot based on The Hobbit that we ran on this channel back on April 23rd. Uh, I've got several of my friends and colleagues with me and we'll go around and introduce ourselves and introduce our characters. Uh, as the uh, host slash player wearing my multiple hats, uh, I'll introduce my uh, character first. I played uh, Sticky Legs, she, her pronouns. Uh, a uh, spider who was uh, using the stats of a black bear from the Honey High system. Um, she was a thief. Um, and <laughs> I'm seeing our uh, friend slash producer, Alice. Are we having some trouble no, I was there, just, Alice? I was like, oh no, we have to remember things about our characters. <laughs> oh. uh, yes. That will be a request, um, <laughs> for sure. I have some notes about I, I have a, so, I just yeah. found my character sheet. I should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> then, let's see. Let's go to Alice next. Oh, gee. Uh, I played Rosie, who is a pony and or small horse. One will never know. Um <laughs> who was a, um, she was the face of the party and she was using the um, polar bear stats. So she was a keen swimmer. <laughs> All that's what Excellent. She, her pronouns for her. And my, uh, were we supposed to introduce ourselves too? Yeah. Hi, I'm Alice Rogers. <laughs> I use she, her pronouns. <laughs> and I'm manager of the media design studios at Virginia Tech University Libraries. And that's and Gaspard. It. I don't know. Yeah, I think they can the... see him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're going to see bit. some dogs in the background. <laughs> It'll happen. Um, but how well behaved they are is still a question. <laughs> uh, and then we'll go to our other player next, Jonathan Bradley. Uh, yeah, me. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bradley. I'm yes. head of studios and innovative technologies for the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Uh, use he, him pronouns. And I played Scraps, again, uh, different Scraps. Um, we are, <laughs> I played uh, who we are affectionately referring to as Edgelord Scraps um, in, the, in this particular adventure. He was the muscle and used, I'm pretty sure, the mm -hmm. Grizzly? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't remember who the muscle. He was terrifying. Yeah, he was terrifying. <laughs> That's right. Um, yep. Yeah. And strong. He was strong. He was strong, strong. and terrifying. He yeah. was a yeah. wolf um, who thought he was a werewolf. And he wasn't out to make friends, but he did make some friends. Or was he a werewolf and was it just about the friends he made along the way? He wasn't a werewolf and he did want to make friends. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> master for this session. I feel like sometimes I should just change my name to reconnecting because I'm pretty sure oh, I dropped no. out there for a second, but I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Kira Dietz. I'm the assistant director of Special Collections and University Archives. I use she, her pronouns, and I was the game master for this game of Honey Heist as I was for the last game of Honey Heist because I like running this game. <laughs> it's a s Excellent, excellent. It's a super fun game. I'll try and post the link because it's made by Grant Howitt. Yes. Um, I think I'd post... He's also made some other one-page RPGs, and maybe one of these days I will run one of those on the screen. I really, I really want someone to run Crash Pandas. Um, that is yeah. that is one that I just like. I don't know if we need to do a one-shot based off of Fast and the Furious, but um, I don't know how a uh, work of literature that will be associated. I mean, I I like the series, but anyway, um, I'm going to post the link in the chat. As, right. Hold as on. someone serialized it as a... I need to understand yeah. a few things. One, yeah. why <laughs> is the go-to for Trash Pandas, Fast and the Furious? No, Crash and Pandas. Crash, crash Pandas. Crash, it's crash, crash, crash Pandas. Pan okay, I thought because it was just about you're raccoons. you a bunch of no. raccoons stealing cars. You're, you're and cars. two, you enjoy the Fast and the Furious franchise. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> you know, it's just. And there's the topic for roll call today. Wow. I mean, well, yeah, everyone, fine. welcome to Fast Talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's like fine. You know, they're movies. Serious talk. I watched the first one, thought this is a pretty good movie. Watched the second one, was like, it's not a great movie. Didn't watch any one after that. I feel. Aren't there like seven or eight now? I think there's I don't eight. know. I, I, there are a bunch. And it does depend on which ones you consider to be part of the canon, fast from what I understand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen one, maybe two. There you go. So. That was our mini episode of Fast Talk. Right. <laughs> yeah, if you want, uh, if you want to hear more Fast Talk, let us know <laughs> in the chat. It won't happen, <laughs> but will it not? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> possible <laughs> that seems like as good a transition as any into That's a transition uh, to what yeah yeah <laughs> we might do something we might not we won't but we'll say we <laughs> what might. about what we're doing today <laughs> i mean who knows nobody knows what we're you know we might explore is fast and the furious based on a work of literature no. maybe loosely <laughs> or has it been serialized since is there a lot <laughs> I don't think the Fast and the Furious is like a Lion King situation where you're just retelling Hamlet. You don't think so? <laughs> I don't. Ooh, ooh, I feel like that's questionable. Oh, there are Fast and the Furious books. It might by the way. be though. It looks like serializations of movies don't count. <laughs> Maybe Fast and Furious Spy Racers. I I'm looking up the use books. See you interested. Anyway. Is that their like line of like children's choose your own adventure novels? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are uh, other works of literature we could adapt for Crash Bandicoot. Yeah. Actual works of literature we could adapt as Crash Band for Crash Bandicoot. I feel like. Wow. Shade on novelizations. I was say. <laughs> I'm just saying, if we're talking about works of literature, there are probably other options. <laughs> You don't go through an English program and not learn to throw shade. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that is the core. Right. That's most of what you learn in the English <laughs> department. Is how to throw shade An properly. important tenet of Which many programs. Funny. We've really come full circle because we started out being like, anything can be a work of literature. Not anything, but like, you know, there's all kinds of things that like, you know, people don't think of as literature, but still are like worth exploring and worth going into and now we're just now people are just trashing fast and the furious yeah but i think that's fair <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i think it absolutely is a fair there um i mean so uh, at the core of it like i take issue i mean well, let's just discuss it at the core of it i take issue welcome with to furious talk where we talk about our mini episode of fast talk <laughs> right yeah um, <laughs> or, or just things we're mad about um <laughs> No, oh, that's <laughs> so I take issue with the traditional definition of literature, and I always have. I like literally when I was an undergrad, I wrote a short story that was like this weird philosophical, like throwing shade at like how we define literature so narrowly and what it leaves out. There, there. So at the core of it, the reason I have that concern is because it excluded a lot of things because they were popular without regard for their quality. And, and there was also, there's a lot of things like racism and colonialism and all that sort of stuff that's wrapped up in what we traditionally view as literature that are, it also makes it problematic. Mm -hmm. I still will maintain that one of the core components is the thing has to be good. Like everything's not just literature, even if it's like crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, like there has to be some semblance of like, quality work put in there the characters are represented well and you know there's the fast and the furious i mean i'm willing to listen to argument about the first movie and maybe others that i haven't seen but the second one i'm like no that was garbage it was a garbage movie <laughs> um so there we go welcome to furious talk uh <laughs> <laughs> thanks i posted a link in the chat on twitch uh for any of our viewers, if you're interested in uh, learning more about novelizations, there was a mini-sode of 99% Invisible where they talked a little bit about novelizations of films uh, and the implications of such work. Uh, 
worth exploring. I mean, I think at the core. Oh, I'm saying. I think at the core of it, it's it's based in like what, the author. What was their goal? Did they want to tell a story? Did they care about what they were doing? And you know, you put the effort into trying to tell like a good story, and then there are people who are just writing things for money, and that's what serializations are. They're here's this popular movie. Here's a popular video game. Like, let me let us just make some money off of it. That being said, like looking at you, Charles Dickens. <laughs> looking at you, Charles Dickens. <laughs> um, that being said, there are people who like get tasked with this from like a huge company and they may genuinely care about mm -hmm. the material. And so like, you can't just write them all off, but there is sort of like, yeah, some people they start in a bad place. Argue that some of them are quite good. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of serializations that are good. I know that, um, the Halo series of video games, there was a, a few serializations of that game that were considered very good works of writing in their own right. Um, I haven't read them, but I know they were getting a lot of sort of attention, especially as far as serializations go. And so, like, for that sort of stuff, I'm fine. But, um, yeah. So, all that to say, if you're our viewers out there and you think, you know what, I've read this novelization of the fifth element or whatever and it's great <laughs> you know let us know we'll talk Wait, why did you go to directly to the fifth or not why did you go directly thing? to the fifth element that's one of the examples okay. that they talk about in the <laughs> i thought you just <laughs> the fifth i had fifth this element podcast, on the mind pull that pull that was out this right podcast there. recent did they talk about uh brian david gilbert's review of all of the halo books um if you're not familiar, this is from December of last it may year. Have been. Brian D David Gilbert read all of the Halo novels, like every single one, and there's like 26 or something. Mm. Um, and then did a. It's part of a mini stories episode, mm. so they don't go into a lot of depth. But uh, I don't know that they got to touch on that. Yeah. But well, welcome to Serial Talk, yeah. where yeah. we talk about novels. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> How many mini podcasts can we shove into this podcast? <laughs> it's the end podcast of the semester. Talk, we we're off the podcasts. rails. <laughs> Welcome. The irony was uh, before. Yeah, no. If you, the irony. If you want to talk about podcasts. I don't want to talk about podcasts. I do. Oh the, ir God. the irony was before the show started, someone said, is Jonathan not talking? Oh, this <laughs> he may not be talking this yes. episode. And proceed to come out of the gate with um, a slew of nonsense about. Um, with many thoughts. Right many thoughts mm -hmm. um oh we're also well, now joined by ollie over my shoulder my dog has been like crying slightly <laughs> also which you may or may not be able to hear no she's yeah. just like sitting on the floor going mm -hmm. over so she just did it again the hobbit very, it's very is the yeah, hobbit, hobbit. let's the talk hobbit. about it what what now let's talk about a game is hobbit Heist? Uh, a work of literature about. it is mm -hmm. that exists uh, that um, our are we <laughs> fabulous sure? game master uh, adapted uh, into this delightful adventure full of spiders. Um, full of spiders. It wasn't just... It, it wasn't, like, infested with spiders. There could have been a lot more. But was it not, though? There were only uh, four of them, <laughs> including you. <laughs> no. In Once we got inside... Uh, well, that's true. But there were literally thousands there were, they were little more. but yeah but like this is not spider heist <laughs> kind of felt like it though <laughs> that would be a, good. that would be an interesting variation <laughs> all spiders uh but for a little more work about the maybe less spider filled uh source material mm -hmm. um could you tell us a little bit about the hobbit its context yeah. for uh for those of us who may not be as familiar First of all, I'm just going to shake my head at that, but uh, uh, yeah, perhaps, yeah, The Hobbit is definitely not nearly as spider-filled as I apparently accidentally made our game, I, which is not to suggest uh, this game is not full of spiders, this, this book is not full of spiders. So The Hobbit uh, is a wonderful, fun, awesome adventure by J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, set in the fantastical, not quite fantastical world of Middle-earth. Um, which also has many names and everything has many names, which was fun to play with in this game. Cause I was like, well, you might call it this, but other people call it this. Uh, and it is, we only, I only use a very small piece of this book. Uh, it is the story of Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit joining up with a group of dwarves and a wizard 
to go on an adventure to reclaim the Lonely Mountain, which was the home, the ancestral home of this particular clan of dwarves. Uh, and it is believed that the as as our character or as the the uh, book is laid out to be, in, it is believed to now be the home of a rather selfish dragon sitting on a golden hoard, <laughs> um, which of course was prime real estate to turn that gold into honey uh, and convince our characters that perhaps if they were to venture into the mountain, they might find a whole lot of gold stuff, which I just let them assume would be honey. <laughs> <laughs> Because what else would animals Man, chasing Man, what a bunch of dummies. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, basically this this story in and of itself is a great adventure. It is also the prequel to the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, because, of course, in the course of the adventure, Bilbo Baggins finds the one ring to rule them all, which is the focus of, of the later work as well. Uh, this is a great, I mean, this is one of my favorite stories of all time. I've been reading this ever since I was a little kid, so I was really excited to adapt it. I was also really intimidated to adapt it because I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to do this story justice. Um, so I just decided to take a little bit of the canon, a little bit of the story, um, and not try to make our characters traverse an entire, well, in this case, three regions of <laughs> Middle Earth in one lovely little one-shot session. But they did get to follow some familiar paths if you've seen the movies or read the book and I will not jump too far ahead of that because we'll talk probably later about how this is represented in other aspects of pop culture um but yeah we got to follow some of that path as our characters went on the search for honey um I could probably talk about this book and Lord of the Rings in general for like hours on end so I will stop there for a minute but real classic piece of science fiction well fantasy and adventure when was it published? Oh, roundabouts, not roundabouts. necessarily like specific date. Mm, come back to Kira on that for a second. She's drawn a blank. <laughs> Real bad with dates. That was why I, I never did well with that part of literature. <laughs> in I will look it up. In, I know like in, uh, I know I know like five dates. Nineteen thirty-seven. Just, like, yeah. just, just like in. Total. Thank you. It was published in nineteen thirty-seven. <laughs> September twenty-first. If you really wanted to know. <laughs> Do you I remember uh, on the 21st because, night of September? Yes. Yeah. Also, Bilbo and Frodo's birthday is September 21st. I didn't realize that. So, mm, that. yeah, it's probably, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of nerd lore in Kira's head about this this literature. So, <laughs> just not the year it was published. Um, and it is, I will admit, and I mentioned this before the game as well, it's generally a pretty serious tale, and it has a lot of dark themes, and those themes continue into um, the the later books as well. There is a lot of war and internal and external struggle. Uh, Honey Heist is by nature a lighter game, so mm -hmm. we kind of, I, I made a point of making this kind of a lighter approach, as I often do with Honey Heist. Um, but we could have played a real dark game, too, if we wanted. <laughs> So sure. I'm going to jump in there. So I, I guess, I mm -hmm. guess we get to the question where it's like, what do you, do you know the work? Uh, I have read the Hobbit. It is the only of J.R.L. Tolkien's books that I have read. I have not read Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, no, I get that. that head shake. I'm going to leave the stream. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to fast talk, everybody. <laughs> no. Serious, no, back to furious talk. We're past um, fast talk. Now it's furious talk where Kira goes, why hasn't everyone memorized the Hobbit? <laughs> no. So I have read the Hobbit. And, and so I went years hearing about how like J.R. Tolkien had like all these dark works and his work also that his like work was really challenging to read and, all this stuff about his language and complication. And when I went to read The Hobbit, I was actually startled by how easy I felt like it was to read and how much, I mean, I, I was mm -hmm. like, this is a children's book. Like, this is how it, it comes across. Mm -hmm. And so, like, when I was reading it, I was reading it from the perspective of, like, this is, like, the characters are in danger, but that's just, a, that's a trope of, like, children's adventure stories mm -hmm. is, like, yeah, the characters get into mm -hmm. danger. And there were sort of some things that are in the back lot that, I guess when you have the context of the Lord of the Rings, make things seem darker, like finding the one ring and what that brings and everything associated with it. But like on its own, as someone who hadn't read Lord of the Rings, I was like, this seems like a fairly standard, like children's adventure story. And it actually was very different than what I expected because I knew it was responsible for a lot of the role playing tropes from like Dungeons and Dragons and 
stuff and so like wizards and i remember one of the things that stuck out to me as i was reading it was like gandalf doesn't do anything <laughs> like i remember saying that at one point i was like how ineffectual he does not. i was like does what not an ineffectual gandalf. wizard like and then he stomps off and gets mad and leaves yeah <laughs> And so I was like, you know, where's all the like magic and fireballs and all this sort of stuff that like is so much a part of it. And so like it was really sort of surreal. And I, I did come away with it wanting to read Lord of the Rings and I do probably someday will still still intend to read it. But um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going to make you read them now because um, I always like to I have to have more people. To talk I, ra- about. I ratted <laughs> myself out, narked on yep, myself. Yep, I'm trying out. <laughs> yeah. But that was that was my well, impression I, from it was was coming away from it and actually being surprised at how little it meant. It, it's sort of the reputation of like J.R.R. Tolkien in general and like in, in both form and content, like the form was easy to read and very accessible and didn't, you know, you hear people talk about the similar alien and like it's oof. like you're translating That's, something it is, from his. It is hard. Right. Like from his own <laughs> unique like language. It's like the encyclopedia, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think, Jonathan, you've hit on a couple of good points. One, The Hobbit is extremely accessible. I read it for the first time when I was, like, nine years old. Too. And that's what it was to me. It was an adventure story. And the second thing that I think you kind of keyed on in on without saying it, maybe, is um, when you when you get people get critical about these works and what different races represent, hobbits are often representative, representative of innocence and childlike elements they have qualities that we often identify with children um so that i think adds to the that element of it being a childlike story the idea that bilbo has never left the shire that he has never gone further than yeah. you know x number of hundred you know miles or x number of miles from his front door um to suddenly cross half a world yeah. um and to have all these things happen is is very like and that's a trope that continues in lord of the rings as well when you have more hobbits going out into other parts of the world that become darker and darker. Um, it can be viewed as a metaphor for growing up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, there's also a lot of war stuff tied up in that, right? That was, that was there always is a lot of war in both in all, in all four of the books, but it was world war one, right. Or two. I don't remember one was, it was after world war one. Right. Well, Hobbit was after world war one. Cause there was, yeah. uh, there was a lot of inspiration for that. From my understanding. I don't know how true that yeah. is though. I've heard that, but I think at one point in time, someone also told me that, that, that he wasn't really trying to write the, a fantasized version of like the world war one for his son. I don't think he was trying to write a fantasized version of world war one, but I think real world. I mean, if you live through a war, yeah, yeah, then that's going to impact everything from now on stories. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's how wars work, (laughs) especially the great war, Mm -hmm. which is what that war was. Until and, there was another one. I live in the, and Lord of the Rings is like war to war to war. It's thank you, uh, Kayla, but I live in the present where we call it World War One. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, to uh, throw this in there before we talk to Alice about her previous experience. I have read no J.R. Tolkien, and I've seen a Hobbit movie. And I have seen the trilogy of Lord of the Rings. Ooh, we should get into the movies. Alice, welcome, We're welcome not going to talk about L-O- LOTR talk where <laughs> Kira laments the fact that her friends have not read this literature. Oh, uh, yeah. I have read all of the books. I read them a long time ago, though. So it's been like I read them. I remember reading like certainly The Hobbit while I was um, cat sitting for a friend. And I just got through it very quickly. <laughs> um and yeah, I, that I read just made my way through Lord of the Rings. And it's been a long time, though. I was just very into fantasy books. And so I was reading those. I was reading a couple of other things. And I've watched both of the animated versions of the Hobbit movie mm-hmm. and the Lord of the, the Lord of the Rings animated. Both. Oh, it's so both. bad. It's so it's so mm. it's so good. Bad. Right. The, the the animated Hobbit movie is good, just straight good. But then the the Lord of the Rings, they start to do sort of that like combination of animation, but also like kind of people in it. Sometimes it's very bad. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw that Hobbit movie when I was them. a kid too. But 
At the time, I don't think I really comprehended what it was. I think it was just a movie with some weird little magical people. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it is. Right. There's a lot of movies from my childhood that I watched and they're like popping up on Netflix and YouTube. Like there's that one with like the little leprechauns that like we watched at school like five or six times and apparently has like a 99% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't, there's a lot of this. I'm assuming not the leprechaun. <laughs> No, not that one. No, no, it's like Dar. Is it like Danny O? Darby O. Gills, like oh Darby O. Gills, that's what it is. Darby O. Gills, yeah, yep, yeah, (laughs) yep. That was the thing. We watched that at school. Television a lot. I think I watched that a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. we watched that at school like four or five times, and (laughs) I had completely forgotten about it, and then it like popped up on I don't know Hulu or something, and I was like, West Virginia public school system. (laughs) That's Wow, wow. <laughs> doxed. I feel doxed. <laughs> uh, I do want to mention before we, we've already gone way past this, but we did have a fourth player in our game. I feel like we should we have did. mentioned Jeff at yeah. the top of the hour, uh, who played uh, uh, Kit Kitson, our fox, uh, who was uh, the brains of the operation, which came in quite handy. And and as I believe, so took the panda um, bear quality of being distractingly adorable. Mm-hmm. Because why wouldn't you? <laughs> But yeah, I watched all of the all of Lord of the Rings movies, and none of the Hobbit movies that came out recently. I just like oh, no. they came out like while I I think primarily while I was in grad school, and I was yes. like I I have to grad school. Sorry, sorry everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say unfortunately Jeff couldn't be here because I know he is sorry. quite familiar with yeah. the the books as well. So because uh, he started rolling his eyes every time I started making or, or smacking himself in the head every time I started making in jokes. Yes. <laughs> Which there were many of. <laughs> mm. Yep. Yeah. Right over Sticky Leg's head. <laughs> yep. Which is surprising. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I probably missed a lot. I got some of your in jokes and your like small references, but it's been so long since I've read the books. Um, I, you know, mm-hmm. would need to revisit probably. Uh, hey, I have a random question. Kira, what would have happened if we followed um, Gollum? Um, so I had a couple of different plots for that. The, it, it, while it is not, it is more or less canonical in the books that uh, Gollum was, of course, following Bilbo and the dwarves uh, to get the ring back because he knew Bilbo had the ring. Because I was playing a little fast and loose with the geography and time and space at that point. Uh, had you followed him, you probably would have, uh, not necessarily, you might have actively encountered the party. Like, I had an idea that you could bump into, or had you followed the road, uh, you definitely would have encountered the dwarves and, and the hobbit themselves, uh, and overheard some of their conversations about the gold in the mountain. Uh, you could have ended up, had you done that, getting to the Long Lake and visiting the town of Dale and actually encountering people oh. but you bypass that entirely mm-hmm. so uh you could have you i i had some stuff in my head had you actually followed Gollum further and tried to encounter Gollum, you could have done so mm. it would have been real strange <laughs> not sure what would have I, happened i'm entirely. really upset now that we didn't get to see kira role play Gollum, and i regret <laughs> all of our decisions that led us not to follow Gollum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we should also tell our viewers that when we were setting this game up, you repeatedly asked me if you could play. Yeah, Gollum. I did. <laughs> multiple <laughs> times. Multiple because times. I knew, because I knew that I was going to potentially put Gollum in the game, and all you did was really hear him a little bit from a distance. You could have had way more interactions that could have gone a very different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a request yeah. in the chat for you to do a little Gollum uh, in role play. So. <laughs> Wait, is that from you? No. <laughs> no, it's, it's, no, it's <laughs> It's from it's uh, from A O Kinnaman. Oh, I know who that is. Yeah, <laughs> just everyone knows who that I is. I think I think you should uh, like you know fulfill the request. Or Jonathan. So, so they asked me. I'm says, willing to Jonathan. do it. Let me. All right, let me remember. Uh, how to well, I mean, we we would have you overheard parts of this two sided <laughs> conversation because of course we hate the Hobbitses. The Hobbitses has our ring. Hmm. But I don't do voices well. So yeah, I don't either. There's a reason I don't do them in my D and D games. You tricksy <laughs> hobbits is still. <laughs> I, get I don't know. So I, Somewhat better. Yeah, I ask you to do things just for the sake of 
seeing if you'll let me and then figure and figure yeah. Yeah, and figuring out what sort of uh it would have been a really different becomes... game if I had let you do that because I don't know who anyone else would have played. Well, so that was the <laughs> trick, though. If you let me play Gollum, I wasn't going to play him like Gollum in the movie. So. You're going to be like super friendly, wants to make friends. Yeah. No, nah, maybe not that. <laughs> yeah. I would have figured something else out. Um, probably some sort of like obsessive compulsive like personality. Um, I mean, which he is sort of obsessive compulsive. But. Um, Something, something to make it more funny and entertaining than because Gollum's a little sad and uh, airy. A little, <laughs> very, very. He's just, a, he's just a little weird guy. Like, well, I mean, he does I bite mean, off a thing. Hashtag finger. spoilers. He's there is what he, he is. What he is. Hashtag spoilers. Go read Lord of the Rings. I mean, he bites off a <laughs> finger. Let's. I mean, that's not great, but yeah. I mean, I'm, those aren't the sort of things that scare me. I guess that's probably what I'm trying to say is like Gollum is at like zero level for like scary, really. Like there's a lot worse things. Well, and I really debated a lot because, as I said, we only did um, what is essentially the second half of the book, everything east of the the mountains. Um, and I debated like, what if we did the first half instead? Or like, what if you went through the mountain? Cause then you definitely would have had more of a chance to meet Gollum. And then I would have had to do like a whole goblin thing. Um, but I was, you know, the Mark would seem like a good setting, a better setting for a bunch of animals trying to find honey mm -hmm. than being inside the mountains or the goblins King, goblin King's halls. What would happen if we so. run in a smog? Uh, Smag. you probably all would have been, uh, all, a lot of burned. Mm. Uh, Honey Heist isn't really like a combat heavy game, so it would have been, yeah. but it doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, Y'all would have had to figure out how to put your bear and criminal skills to use in evading and defeating a dragon or convincing a dragon not to eat you. What if we just become best friends? That doesn't seem like, that doesn't <laughs> seem like uh, our scraps is best tactic for all you know scraps uh you know he was just alone in that lonely mountain and just needed a new friend i mean if someone had mm -hmm. just talked to him but scraps yeah. didn't want friends so but spoiler he yeah. did want that he did, he did want, want friends <laughs> made some maybe made some friends in an epilogue that were real cool yeah, yeah. real cool friends yeah it's about a little shadow. peek behind the curtain really cool names there great names way better than scraps I think Scraps the first time around was like just too dumb to. I mean, I heard your comment, and we'll deal with that in a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, how dare you? Um, Scraps the first time around was just like too dumb to like really understand that people didn't want to be his friend and just assumed everybody what did want to be friends. Scraps the second time around was more like uh, like a teenager, like. I'm like a cool lone wolf and um, yeah, whatever. Like we could hang out or something, but no, yeah, it's not, not important to me. I'm just off, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So is next, you just desperately next, need validation. Is next honey heist, like scraps the third going to be like nine, like 30 year old has a family at home scraps, like, like dad scraps. I was, <laughs> I was thinking like recently divorced. <laughs> like scraps. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to get back out there. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> living my best life now people if our audience has suggestions for other literature they would like me to turn into honey heights we can get scraps back as either dad scraps or dad scraps uh or divorced <laughs> starting his life over again scraps oh. <laughs> yeah that could be fun also how dare you insult the name scraps it's it's brilliant <laughs> I love Scraps in Scraps' as many forms. I think it's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, if you did not see our Winnie the Pooh uh, honey heist back in December, Scraps the first was uh, a, a great Pyrenees. Yes. Yeah. Who thought he was Polar bear. a bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got a question from the chat thief. of why is making yeah. friends with people always the strategy? Because Scraps is a dog. <laughs> that's the that's the go to strategy for dogs. Like like as a joke, but also literally. Like if you run into a dog that's like stray, like they if as, unless they haven't been like abused or something, they'll come up to you and be like, "Hey, new friend," like. Mm -hmm. And sure. the wolf was just like one one step. Uh, I mean, we all know he wasn't really a bear, 
Let's be honest. We're in roll. We're in roll <laughs> yeah, call. I thought he was a we're bear. in roll call now. Uh, we can be honest about Scraps' uh, goals and and stuff that Scraps can't himself can't be honest about. Mm. No, that's fair. Welcome to Scraps. There's a lot talk. of things Scraps talk. Yeah, yeah you, Scraps psyche. Scraps lives an inauthentic yeah, sometimes life. Sometimes you can't admit things about yourself. As so as uh, it's tough. Jean Paul Sartre would say, "Scraps lives an inauthentic life." I mean. Can't live how he really wants to be. He's always got to have some sort of false life on top of it that he pursues. Mm. Got it. Finally, an admission. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to existential talk. <laughs> Sounds like we it. We analyze right. our characters using <laughs> philosophy. Right. Now, Sticky Legs is extremely authentic. Mm. I think Rosie is pretty authentic, so. too. Yeah, but yeah. but also just just scraps. I, I not live in that authentic. I life. told Kayla yesterday. I was like, um, basically, Rosie was like scraps from the first campaign. <laughs> yeah, she definitely has some yeah. of those vibes for sure, for sure. And new scraps hated it. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. I mean, I you know, horses are pretty go with the flow, but also pretty like I don't know. They seem like they'd be happy creatures. Give I really enjoyed apple. your your physical mnemonics of like your dancing and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The, the <laughs> horse and Fox performance in the middle of the game there. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Team distraction. So physical, like physical <laughs> movements and, and like mimicking of action you can either go like really well or like really poorly. I think um, mm. it's also how you can break things in your you house. You can also physically, but that's, that's usually how Sometimes. it goes really poorly. Um, <laughs> Sure. Or it just like you're trying to do something very extravagant and you can't given your like limitations. So you like do all this like weird controlled stuff and it just comes off awkward. But it worked really well for your little dance. Yeah, um, I think it worked well. And obviously the dance was very successful. It was. It, it was, was. Surprisingly <laughs> successful. quite successful as a distraction. That was. elf was like really into this weird <laughs> show that came out of the middle of the Markwood and just, but, just performed but, for him. Let's be honest. Say, all right, you're sitting on like your porch. And a horse mm -hmm. with a fox on its back comes running up and just starts dancing in front of you. That's a trap. And you yeah. need to call somebody. <laughs> yeah. You need to get Absolutely. out of there. He was uh, definitely bored on watch duty, had been stuck at this outpost for too long. And, uh, you know, they rolled really well. So I had to give it to him. I mean, that, yeah, all that's fair. Well. It's fair. But that's a trap. Just uh, like PSA for everyone out there, public service announcement. <laughs> Ever get approached by a dancing horse <laughs> with a fox on its back? Watch your back. It's That's a trap. the <laughs> steer clear. Watch your own back. That's the rhyme. <laughs> wow. Rhyme back with back. Excellent. Mm. Such a bard yep. am I. <sighs> Have you ever oh played goodness. a bard? Um, well, welcome to Bard Talk. No. I don't think I have. <laughs> I was going to say. I don't think you have. Interesting. I'm I'm an almost forever DM. So, I mean, I guess I've played bards as the DM, but like a long-term character now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe so. There's there's a number of classes I haven't played. Term character, especially from 5e, where they're back in second edition, I played more, but classes were limited. Mm. Oh, I will say, had you followed Gollum, you probably would have heard some riddles. Mm. I was there wondering. Some riddles in my notes. I was wondering if you had yep. riddles prepared for Gollum. I did have some riddles in my mm. notes. Well, I had riddles from Gollum's encounter in the mountains oh. that Gollum would have been repeating to himself. Kira's big book of riddles for RPGs. You should just make you. No, they're actual <laughs> riddles from the book, mm. from the riddling contest between Bilbo and Gollum. Mm. That's exciting. <laughs> also, keep in mind, Was had you followed Gollum and encountered Gollum, you were still animals. You weren't going to be able to communicate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With a humanoid. Fair. <laughs> Can the players answer I think there's some animal animal qualities to Gollum, which is why I allowed you to understand as much of him as you did, because I think there's an overlap. Would you like me to pose a riddle to the players? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's what it looks like. There's a, another formal request from the chat on Twitch. Yeah, but if you've read the book, then you know the answer. To you may know the it's answer. been a while. I feel like that's, that's generous. Whether I remember okay. anything, yeah, or... we can give it a go. Uh, well, then I'll give you, I'll give you the easy one first. Okay. Let's go. Uh, what has mm. what has roots as nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. 
Didn't you add, didn't you do this one during the Sherlock Holmes one? No, I don't think so. What Those are different. I used something similar, I think, for the Sherlock one game. That was from a different source, but I think it was right. something similar. Read it again. What has roots as nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up it goes and yet never grows. I did use something similar, so maybe you, the answer might already be out there. Well, now I can't stop thinking of boots, though. <laughs> It's not boots. No, yeah. But that was the answer in the in the Sherlock Holmes one. <laughs> well, there were six riddles in the Sherlock one game. Mm. Like. That's the one I remember, though, because I figured it out a lot earlier than the players. And I was like, I'm it's like, you boots. You playing that game. <laughs> um, oh, maybe mm. we're not going to make it to the harder one. Mm. Maybe that one's not harder. It's just longer. Roots that no one sees. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shall we ask our audience how long I should give you all? <laughs> mm. I'm so bad at riddles. What's the last part? It never grows. Uh, up, up it grows and yet never grows. Up, up it goes, right? Up, up it goes yep. and yet it never grows. grows. Mm, a geyser. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't know. That's my answer. <laughs> okay. Mountain. I've said that's yes. what I got. Okay. There it is. It's a mountain. I don't like that one for roots. I don't I'm like, like that for either for roots either. Well, that's the point. <laughs> well, no, but I mean a riddle. Also, they do. I grow. mean, a good riddle when you know the answer, you're like, <laughs> duh! I can't believe it didn't. That like makes perfect sense. Um. And like everything else about that one, I was like, yeah, like that's sure it could be a mountain. I also thought waterfall was like, Ooh. I mean, I could sort of be that. Um, but I was like, I mean, technically a waterfall goes down, but if you're at the bottom of it, it looks like it goes up. All right. And I, I, I had a second one in my notes, mm -hmm. uh, which is it cannot be seen. It cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills. And empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life and kills laughter. Either darkness or shadow, I think. Yeah, yeah darkness. You got it. Mm -hmm. It's dark. Yeah. Yeah, darkness. <laughs> okay, apparently that was the easy that one. That was the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Answered some riddles. I mean, mm -hmm. There you go. Riddles yeah. answered. Official uh, formal request fulfilled. Okay. Thank you. Twitch chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, were there any other things that y'all, as folks who have read the story, expected to run into in the session that we didn't run into? An ineffectual wizard. Mm. Well, by that point in the story, the ineffectual wizard has parted ways with the party. I know. I wanted to run it. I wanted to run it. I wanted to run into. <laughs> Like, hey, this guy's got a nice hat. I'm gonna go talk. Smoking his pipe in the woods. Right. <laughs> Wonder if he could cast some magic. Nope. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Apparently not. I can't think of anything specifically. I mean, that was mostly it. I mean, we got the spiders and the mirkwood and ran into some elves. Got to smog and his his biz. Didn't get to really interact with small but that's probably for the best part of me was like yeah. we all just go get tpk'd but we have fun doing I mean, it <laughs> <laughs> if you can have a tpk in in uh i feel like in honey heist what would have happened was more like you would have had to keep rolling things and either somebody would have just gone completely criminal or somebody would have just gone completely feral because you wouldn't have had enough time mm. to do anything about that the staircase we almost i almost went there that staircase is real rough <laughs> it was pony it versus designed. staircase i mean let's be honest yeah. not an accessible dungeon no it was not no. Uh, it was not the mountain was not ready for a pony mm -hmm. uh and a lot of time yeah uh there were some other elements once you got in the mountain that uh, we we were close to time, so we didn't. There are other things that I had planned that y'all didn't even encounter, other than the stairwell of doom that stumped you. 
<laughs> I mean, it didn't stump me. Mostly stumped to the horse. Stuff. I was hey. like, jump. <laughs> I mean, is there some sort of fantasy OSHA that we should be contacting? <laughs> Inside the Lonely Mountain, OSHA's not going in there until mm. that dragon is, is out. Let's be clear. Uh, if you do play yeah. D&D, yeah. I know that there's like a... Co- uh, I'd have to like look them up, but there is like a group that has been making like accessible dungeons, especially because there's the combat mm-hmm. wheelchair uh, mm-hmm. addendum yes. for D&D that also was made by someone whose name I'm forgetting right now. But uh, both those things are available this just did not happen to be a particularly accessible dungeon. Well, potentially, uh, well, it wasn't a dungeon. It was the interior. Of a That's mountain. true. Uh, potentially, there were going to be some flooded areas that a certain pony could have been swimming through, but. <laughs> that was definitely my one strong suit, so. I do, I do love that so far, both of our Honey Heist games have started with Scrap so much drowning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean that couldn't have been better if we like. I, I promise none of that was planned. It really came down to. Like, oh yeah, I rolled. Balls, I rolled real bad. But... Well, I'm gonna be real disappointed if the first thing we do if we play this again and I'm playing is not there's a river in front of you you gotta cross. <laughs> so that I have the. Op- it doesn't matter what Fair. what piece of I, ch- literature I choose. Is, I will put a river. I choose to fail. A river. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we put you in a desert somehow, there's gonna be a river. Yeah, maybe it'll be Excellent. Dune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, almost drowning in an oasis yeah. the spice must flow yeah. drowning in like a sa- <laughs> like a sand pit yeah there we go yeah. there we go yeah. love to see it this is like past times but different <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been here before oh me yeah well, we'll see if you viewers have suggestions for future bodies of water that scraps could almost drown in Put them in the chat. What if we do an all body of water honey heist? Ooh. Just constant drowning. Are we, are, yeah. Has anyone I'm ever, like water world? Can, like the we, open boat. Can we redo the open boat? Oh, in a God. oh you can God. Re, you can redo any work we've previously done. I'm really curious who's going to do the first redo. Because I really mm-hmm. want to see someone else's yeah. interpretation of, of the works. Um my. I I am of course so severely t- I am tempted to do a redo because I would love to do my take on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I, that was the one I assumed most <laughs> yeah. people would. That's the one yeah. that will get redone first. Maybe I mean I'm certainly tempted to do it. Well, I think I think Anthony also was potentially interested in, in doing it as well because he also really enjoys the story. So, but there's so much out there that like I have I know some other great children's literature of the same time period that has similar themes and ideas that would be equally fun to do. So, yeah, it is it is tough because there's we're still... all this stuff out there to potentially do and to go back and yeah. redo one. Right. But I mean, I'm I'm curious. I mean, yeah, the idea of I got too many other ideas. <laughs> the idea of like I mean, when you're in an English class and you're doing literary analysis, is that like people are going to have different like ways of analyzing a story and there's whole different theoretical structures for like how you analyze literature. So at the core of it, my opinion is like that same thing applies here. Like there's different ways of interpreting and converting and that in its own right is a value, like how someone else approaches and what they find valuable in something. I will say, as a DM, I was all too excited to have you, or a GM in this case, all too excited to have you all start off by meeting Bjorn. Like, I was like, of course the first thing they're going to do is meet the bear man, man bear. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Were there any... So, we've talked a little bit about the themes that were explored in the one shot. Were there other themes from the work that you would have liked to include, but weren't able to for some reason. Yeah, like, um, so there, like I said, there are some big, pretty big themes of conflict in this book. Um, and that is, it's a little heavy. And like I said, it didn't necessarily fit into the way I was envisioning this game. So we didn't really get into it. But like I said, you could have gone and gotten to the, the town of people and had you gotten to Dale, you would have found yourselves in the midst of what is a con- what is then a war that's building at that point in the book between uh, dwarves that are gathering from different places, the elves and the humans, uh, as well as the dragon <laughs> and the orcs and goblins. So you could have, had you gone in a slightly different direction, found yourselves smack in the middle of a war, <laughs> <That seems laughs> which like- would have been 
really different. <laughs> Seems like that would have been really yeah. derailing. Yeah, it would have been, but, you know, could have been a thing yeah. had you traveled in that direction instead. I'm glad we avoided it. <laughs> I am, too. I'm glad I didn't really want to. I wasn't necessarily, like, looking to go that route, and I probably would have pushed you back. But storyline-wise, that's the other, like, major plot point that's there. Yeah. Or you could have gotten rid of the dragon and then you had to keep everyone else out of the mountain because you were claiming it for yourselves. I don't know. I don't want, I don't want that Ooh. mountain. <laughs> full of, it's full of stupid heavy rocks that are shiny. I got nothing yeah. for me. And and uh, and, some, and a lot of tiny spiders. <laughs> a lot. So many I'll, tiny I'll spiders. I will trade as many shiny rock coins uh, for friendship that is available. Mm. <laughs> well, you could buy friendship with shiny rock coins. I know. Probably. Potentially, so I don't know that Scraps would have understood that as a possibility, but yeah, <laughs> that it could be quite fruitful. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of Scraps, as we have for basically the whole show, um, do you think <laughs> that Scraps was particularly well suited for this adventure? Other players, do you think your character was particularly well suited for this adventure? Um, I mean, he was perfect for this adventure. Uh, in the sense that we're playing Honey Heist and we're having fun and he's goofy and silly and is just out there to <laughs> he's just an excuse for me to make stupid jokes <laughs> so yes he's perfectly <laughs> suited for this campaign he is also suited in any Honey Heist game to keep the plot going <laughs> yeah Scrap's got places to be that's true that's mostly Jonathan that's Jonathan's suited for these adventures to keep things going <laughs> Yeah, I think Rosie was very well suited to the group, to the dynamic of everything, as well as, you know, keeping things going. Yeah. The scraps. I think we had a good good dynamic going. Kit Kitson, you know. Mm -hmm. The scraps versus a plus Rosie dynamic second in command. was enjoyable to me. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, maybe I'll just stay, maybe I'll just stay here with the spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, trying to be brooding, great. and you're way too excited about all this stuff. I mean, there's honey <laughs> in the future. And maybe some more apples. Don't Ooh. you know that life is punishment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, wow. What about sticky legs? You yeah, sticky question legs. To yeah. Yourself. Turn that question mm -hmm. back on the question. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think... Fairly well suited. I mean, because I wasn't familiar with the work when I was presented with the opportunity to make a character, I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I what I need to do. But I was like, a thief, that's a thing I can understand. Um, and I don't like spiders, but they're effective Ooh. at, uh, you know, many things associated with thieving. And it seems like You'd be easily able to steal some honey. So, sure. That's why I'm terrified of them. They're such effective murderers. I was <laughs> such effective murderers. I yeah. was really excited about Sticky Legs because I knew there were giant spiders in your future. And I was like, yes, plot hook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can tie Sticky Legs into this crew. I love that, like, Sticky Legs of the money. That was so good. Yeah. <laughs> she outsmarted them on a previous job. And they wanted their, you know, wanted their, uh, wanted their cut. Mm -hmm. They got what they deserved. Uh, They're cut. They did. <laughs> they got their they stuff. They did get their stuff. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, because yeah. I, I was going to ask, well, what happens if we just left? <laughs> like, peace out, guys. Uh, they would have definitely <laughs> followed you and probably been uh, some tough competition. They would have followed you in search of uh, what you were after because they assumed that it had value. And uh, you probably would have bumped into them again, maybe would have had to fight them or otherwise convince them. But once they're out of the Merkwood, they're far less formidable. <laughs> it's true. Are they? You don't know. I mean... In, what do you know about giant spiders? Uh, I mean, I, I can imagine... I've read their entry I was in... the GM! This was my game! <laughs> I've read their entry in the Dungeon Masters or the dungeon, the Monster Manual many times. <laughs> Maybe Middle Earth giant spiders are stronger when you put them in the Lonely Mountain. I was just... I would be concerned, mm. like, going down the river, we'd be a lot faster than they could probably move on land. They would have been clinging to the bottom of your boat like people underneath a truck. And that would... Get bit by a giant <laughs> bass. 
<laughs> I mean, for all you know, they might have had other allies. They might have come after you. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It was a thing I considered suggesting that we just peace out. I knew. I think you had suggested that or yeah. alluded to that. Yeah. I think I alluded to it, but I was like, I don't know. This Going and dealing with their stuff might be like 30 minutes of this game that we don't want to skip. <laughs> <laughs> seems like maybe it is I, I knew it was an option and I definitely had a plan if you just decided to skip out or you know or if you went and did the job but then ran off with their their spider silk instead of returning it or... it also seemed real it <laughs> seemed real fun to mess with some elves it was also part yeah. of mm -hmm. but not too many elves yeah. just enough elves I mean you could have gone further in than the outpost and you know dealt with a whole lot more elves I had whole other schemes for what that would have happened so okay what would have happened there What's what's the story there well, there's great plot points in there. You could have ended up in the middle of a, an elven settlement and had to find a creative way out because it also connects to the rivers. So, you know, you were given, you made a new friend after you dealt with the spiders who showed you a quick path to the edge of the forest. There are a bunch of rivers that connect. So had you ended up in the middle of a whole mess of elves, they probably wouldn't have been too happy about all of you unless you gave another stellar performance there, Rosie. But I don't know that the uh, <laughs> the Elven King would have been quite as enamored. So yeah, I assume that might have been a little you harder. You could have had to had to escape from some elves. Could have had to find a different way through the rest of the woods to the mountain. What's the deal with these aggressive oh, elves? Nice. Jeez, <laughs> just a wolf and and some friends passing through. Leave us be. Some friends, just walking some friends. The of their town. That's right. not the way that works. We got stuff to do. That's not my fault. You built this whole civilization this... here. <laughs> yep, that's fair. Um, did you have a favorite NPC? Anyone in particular that stood out? Probably only Shadow. Maybe I was going to say probably uh, the one that we didn't see, Tooth, something Tooth, Tooth. War Tooth. Tooth was cool. Yep. There was there was tooth, and I actually had a fourth <laughs> warg name, but I don't think it came up. Yeah, I don't think it did. Uh, that was gruff. To tooth was never on screen, but no, tooth, tooth had was a just the keep. He was the teller of stories, right. man. That guy knows all the. We stories. got a little legend about tooth and among our our new cool group, <laughs> group mm. of cool guys. <laughs> so like the NPC you didn't even meet was the one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's not that's it. not that strange though. Like often, like NPCs no. that like you hear about in legend and stuff like can have an impact because people tell stories about them and they become like a lot of times stories can be more interesting than the like reality of it. Like in real life, but also in fantasy like role playing settings. I don't know if I should tell Jonathan there were potentially giant eagles that you didn't meet. I also has to be a giant <laughs> eagle. I did too. Yeah. I. One of my suggestions was I play a giant eagle. I come in, don't introduce myself. Everyone else plays the game. And then at the very end, I swoop in and carry everybody away <laughs> and go, I was a giant eagle the whole time. <laughs> but we decided that would be yes. boring if I just sat there. Well, and, and in Alice's case, because she actually did raise this question as well. I will say that was a, that was me making a GM discretion decision because I really didn't know how a giant eagle was going to fit through the Mirkwood and it was either going to be like you spending most of the adventure like flying above the Mirkwood which not being able to see everything that was going on or you were going to have to try and walk your way through the forest which didn't seem like for a giant eagle not particularly convenient yeah. as someone with a ranger who often summons them if you don't have room for them it's a bad move <laughs> <laughs> or if it's dark so can I will really say clog people up consider a hallway. that that was just DM's discretion that I was like mm, maybe not this time <laughs> In the future, we'll play a giant eagle who only shows up at the end of the adventure. Nobody was like a huge fan of Aza, the spider who ran the gang. He was all right. Or Kakri, the one who kept telling Rosie all those things he wasn't supposed to be talking about. <laughs> also, I mean, okay. that one was particularly good. Yeah. I mean, the spiders were good. Uh, the whole in thing with the spiders was distracted in Scraps' mind because at that point he was just realizing how annoying Rosie was. <laughs> I really mm. liked the wards myself stuff. as well, and I I originally was going to try and do them a little more Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, mm. but I just didn't didn't have the brain power for that. <laughs> that would have been yeah. fun. That whole bit, mm. um, 
of taking some other characters from media and then representing them as something weird and in a different context is uh, always a bit of fun. Which, I mean, is a yeah. form of, like, adaptation. I mean, that's what we're yeah. doing mm-hmm. as a whole, yeah. but we're just sort of pulling interesting characters from other media. I have to say, I we were talking briefly, to go back to an older question, uh, things that sure. I, like, not wish that we had gone into, but I kind of had thought we might, and we had talked about this a little bit, uh, we didn't actually get to be in the Shire at all, um, which I thought, like, when I think of, like, Honey Heist, and maybe it's just because we did, like, Winnie the Pooh, I think of, like, the Shire and the Hundred, Hundred Acre Wood being, like, kind of, like, thematically more similar, potentially. Like, these places, mm-hmm. like, looking kind of aesthetically similar. But, of course, we didn't get to be in the Shire. We were in the Berkwood, which is, like, a little bit more dreary. More edgelord. <laughs> Better place for this new scraps. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Almost as if I planned it. I didn't. I didn't plan it at all. I was just. I don't even remember why, where Edgelord scraps came from. I think I was like, what is the opposite of scraps? Mm hmm. Someone who's. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah. Do you think. It's all good. It's all good. I'm checking to make sure. Let me see how it's going here. It's yeah, not not Hashtag quite yet. Technology. Uh, it it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, one day we'll be able to do this show in person. I mean, probably in, the, in Newman Library probably in the fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, maybe there'll be some sort of set. I don't know. How's it gonna work? Set. It's great. Alice, yeah, were you told like about a set? A backdrop? <laughs> no. You know. I know. But I think there's. I there mean, we should have. Hold on. We should have talked about this offline. There should be a curtain and some chairs at least. I'm not insisting on like my own Conan desk. But. Okay. Ooh. But are, but are you? <laughs> but are you? But am I not? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Give you some fake little cards that but. you read off of. <laughs> Tap them on the table. Yeah, we definitely make cards. Tap them on the table. Yeah, I think you that yeah. that seems very you. It seems on brand. <laughs> Every now and then you pull yeah. out. I've been watching a lot of QI clips lately. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have that's, that's fair. true. That's fair. Mm. See, are we? Okay. I think yeah, we're, Kira's back. We're back. I'm back. I was gonna say Should, it's been. Um, so this is we were talking about before. This is our, this is our second or our third honey heist second. on second second on stream second on on stream. On stream. I've run yeah. about eight or ten games of honey heist in different settings now. Sometimes themed, sometimes not. I did run one for a library game night that was uh, Halloween themed, so that was real fun. There were some ghost mm-hmm. bees and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, <laughs> with puns that you might imagine from that description. Yep. Yep. yep, there were yep there were a lot of those, a lot of a lot of bee puns. I uh, yeah, so I like running honey heist a lot, so it's it's relatively easy to run, so that's why I do it. I'm sure I'll do more of it in the future on stream and off. But the yeah. nice thing about rules like games is that they're great for. I mean, all of us are you know, D and D like we're familiar with D and D and probably a few other systems, but mm-hmm. like you know, honey heist is such a nice rules light system that you can do a whole lot with still. Um, but there's there's so many like wonderful aspects to it that make it great for new players. Yeah. I heard someone yeah. else talk. Yeah, I did too. Oh, it was yeah. probably people outside my apartment. Ah. I have a door open. Fancy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I have been getting more into like rules light. Well, I've been th- also thinking of like custom rules. I had to do that for the open boat, and yeah. I got a I got a mm-hmm. project in mind that would also require a more complicated version of that that I'm been mm-hmm. slowly developing. Yeah, I have I have a potential series of things that I'd like to do potentially. I think I've talked about this before. Um, that would I think would not be as D and D friendly as some other things. 
And so I'm trying yeah. to find a nice rules light system to go with it. Because again, like, especially if we have folks who are new to tabletop role playing games, I think it's really good to do some of these other systems that are a little bit easier to learn and pick up on the fly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think- well, and there, I told Jonathan recently, there's a new variant of Honey Heist Out that's basically like paladins versus heretics. <laughs> so you're hunting for a holy relic and... Ooh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little excited about that one. (laughs) Yeah. So, like, the project that I'm pondering would be a series as well. And I'm basically sort of making my own, like, simple, like, series of, like, rules for it. And, like, I came to that because I was, like, thinking about the series and I was, like, started from D&D just because I think in the world of tabletop role playing games, we just have a tendency to do that. And I was, like, okay, so what do I have to take out? Because that's often what we ask ourselves when mm-hmm, we're making mm-hmm. these like sessions is like, well, what doesn't work? And I was like, okay, so like basically no races because the world only has humans. And I was like, okay, well then, ba- and also like basically no classes. There's no magic casters. So anyone who's a magic caster is like gone. And I was like, okay, so fighters. So everybody's a fighter. And the moment that I'm like, everybody's this, then I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't the system to use right. <laughs> when I start taking things away. And so it becomes like, well, what do I need? And from like from like Dun- Dungeons and Dragons or some other like role playing system and start picking out the individual components. So like one thing that I am incorporating in that one is like the skill system. Like here's a set of skills. You can be proficient in them and it gives you some sort of bonus to it. And there will be combat, so, like, have to have, like, an armor class, hit points, like, combat-based thing. But, like, let's tweak those and, and make them simpler. And, and nobody's, like, super tough. I got 200 hit points. Um, cause that's, tough boys. <laughs> well, yeah, like, well, that never made much sense to me anyways. Like, how you might get killed by a rat bite when you're, like, level <laughs> 1 and then when you're level 20. Um, you get hit by a meteor and you're like, whoo, took away a quarter of my hit points. Like, um, <laughs> well, now fighter talk. Right, well, where we talk-, <laughs> talk about fighter. Um, well, the best way it was ever described to me, and it's always been my head cannon. I don't know if it's like, I, th- I mean, it was from Watsy, I think at one point said this, but like the idea is less about like you actually taking damage and your hit points are representative of how talented you capable you are at diverting damage to minimize it and your hit points are really more of like a stamina the longer you go the more you fight the more you take these like grazing blows and and stuff the less capable you become of preventing yourself from taking a deadly blow it is not a measure of actual like hits or arrow shots in the shoulder or stabs to the chest that you've taken um and and despite the fact that that's my headcanon, I never role play it that way. I still describe like, yeah, you like you take a stab in the gut um, because it's weird to be like, yeah, you took another really hard glancing blow that <laughs> took a lot of your hit points away, but did no real like lasting like damage to you. And, and like because that's not fun to describe. So, I mean, we'll do theater of the mind over mechanics any day, I think. Yeah. There's this really also, none of that in Honey Heist. So nothing to worry. <laughs> yeah. None of those mechanics. Yeah. No no real combat mechanics. There's an interesting system that I've been like looking at recently, which I've talked about I think before, the Ryutama system, where they make your initiative is like your HP for the scenario. Which I think makes sense in a lot of ways. Like how prepared you are for the fight indicates like how well you'll do. Like if you are Don't like it. if you are caught yeah. like not and the, Don't like the one thing that you can do is that if you assess the situation, you can re-roll your initiative, in which case you can, like, re-roll mm-hmm. kind of, like, your, like, ability in that battle. But it's sort of, like, if you're caught off guard, then you're not going to do well um, in that yeah. fight overall. I mean, but are, are combats intended yeah. to be, like, one round, though? Yeah, I think because they're meant like, to be like kind it- of short. Like if it's if it's just like a snap thing, like no combat really goes beyond like one round, then I could agree with that. I think you'd probably have to have more focus than D and D does on like bonuses to your initiative for like doing and having certain traits and abilities. But if it's gonna go more than one round, I think the idea that like you're not prepared for that particular battle sort of goes out the window because you've had time to collect yourself. 
Yeah, well, that they allow you, if you have want to collect yourself, you can just re-roll your initiative. So that gives you that ability. Like, if you roll bad initiative, probably the first thing you'll do is re-roll your initiative to be not so shitty, you know? Um, crappy, I mean. Such language. <laughs> That's on, fine. We're going to get, get kicked off We're Twitch, adults. Twitch now. Jeez. We're not going to get kicked <laughs> off Twitch. Welcome, welcome to Swear Talk, where we but I do think the game we're playing, and now we're talking about... Yeah, this <laughs> game is not, like, combat-focused, and so combat is intended to be rel- relatively quick, like, not supposed to be something that you're in all the time or even every game, so... Um, I mean, I, I, I can really get behind that. I, I would tell people... Yeah, that kind of structure makes sense if it's de-emphasized. Yeah. yeah. Like... It, on purpose. I mean, I, I think I talked about this previously, but when I'm running a one shot, I often like if I'm coming up with bad guys, I go find a bad guy that's probably like way too strong for this party. Um, like would be in if in the like parlance of like um, fifth edition, like a, a super deadly encounter, like beyond deadly to like super deadly. And then like I cut their hit points in like half, but I leave everything else to make essentially a glass cannon. So the battle doesn't last long, but you still feel danger because a lot of times, like especially in fifth edition, it's designed for people to do a certain number of things in a, a set amount of time. So their expectation is that you know a character, a monster with two hundred hit points is going to last three rounds or whatever depends on the level and stuff that they have, and in that amount of time they're going to take this many actions and these actions damage. Um, and so they're they're banking on them existing for a long time, and in a one shot, combat that drags on is boring. But also like, you want them to be scary in that they could kill still kill you in a short period of time, but maybe not stay up as long as they would. So I leave their damage output basically the same, um, so that they're still like when they hit you, you know it. Um, which y'all y'all have played in the games I've DM for the one shot and probably gotten hit by a few things and been like. Ooh, I don't know we're going to survive this, but um, <laughs> I mean, I think that makes for a little bit more fun for a one shot because you get you get out of the combat before it starts dragging on too long. But there's still that imminent threat and danger of like this this creature's potential potentially killing you within that short period of time. Yeah, and that's a great transition into <laughs> advice that our was game so master. so good at that. I was like, <laughs> welcome to combat talk. What is, what is happening now? <laughs> our game master, Kira, uh, do you have any advice that you would give to someone who's designing a one shot like this, potentially for the first time? I was gonna, don't think about combat. That's what I like about <laughs> Honey Heights is I don't have to worry about combat mechanics. As someone who is finally learning combat mechanics for 5e, <laughs> like how to, how to build combat and how to fight yourself as well as have other people fight you. It's hard well, to fight spoilers yourself. We'll for the next roll call. The, yeah. Spoiler for the next roll call. We'll talk about this on the next roll call because oops, o- oops, my NPC did something I didn't think they were going to do. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that later. I mean, I've talked about Honey Heist before, so I, I don't want to like be super repetitive, but the thing I like about this system, and I've kind of already mentioned this today, is it's a great jumping off point for people who want to learn about GMing. It's literally one page for players, one page for the GM. You have some really fun character sheets that your players can have. You even have pages where you can your players can draw their characters. And I've had games that during the course of the game, everybody drew their characters, colored their characters, were sharing them <laughs> on camera. Um, so, and then there are some other elements that I have not used, um, in the games on stream because they've been themed around literature. So it's a little bit harder. They've been a little more animal focused and not encountering people, but there's, I, I will have to work on one, uh, where our players will definitely have opportunity to run into people. Cause there's a real fun mechanic where your bears or potentially other animals, uh, get to wear human clothes. And you have something called the human believability score, which if you encounter humans, you they roll checks against your costume elements to determine if they believe that you are, in fact, a person in some sort of strange costume or wondering why there's a bear wearing people clothes. <laughs> Trying to I do mean, that's something. fair. Well, not- so the nice thing about the system is you can add in elements or you don't have to use those elements if you want to keep it simple. Yeah. This is an yeah. example of what it oh could look God. like if you if your polar drew, bear has a crown and yeah. some some if your polar bear yeah. named Clarissa Darling yep. has a black leather mini skirt and a crown. Yep. Uh, you know. 
those are some of them are blank yeah and that's it, all on the link to honey heist that we put up earlier but others give you the starting bear and then you just get to draw the clothes which yeah. is great if you're terrible at art like this gal <laughs> so yeah. it's also only a two stat game so the character sheet helps you keep track of that as well so that's nice as a GM. I always tell my players in Honey Highs, I'm like, look, you're responsible for keeping track of your two stats. I'm, you know, if you're if you're going one way or the other and it's going to affect the story, obviously I want to know, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it also does drive the players towards role-playing. Yeah. Like, yes. yeah. yeah, it's very RP heavy. Like, there's the, like, three pillars of D&D, which are, like, exploration, um, like, social engagement, and... Um, combat but combat has a tendency to dominate so much and so when you go into a D game like most like i that's one of the things that's come up on this like on roll call before was like i had like one small fight or something in a a one shot and it seems strange to players because because that's what you do in D and it's so much of that combat heavy there's no combat in and and so people have to like play and if that's what you're wanting and and since it's just it's geared towards humor i mean the it's yeah. rife for that yeah. you get people people have the opportunity to just sort of like goof off and have fun with what they're doing and mm -hmm. is a lot more lighthearted introduction than i would argue yeah like. and you can you can still introduce combat or your players can introduce combat themselves but there it's just you don't it's it's and it's fun to resolve because you still do it within the constructs and the characteristics that your players have. Um, it just doesn't play out in the same way. You're not going to roll for initiative. You're not going to like, I use this weapon. It's just, yeah, I'm a bear or yeah. a horse or a wolf <laughs> fighting another animal. How am I going to, yeah. you know, how am, am how I going to do, do that it? as an animal? Am I going to use my criminal skills? Like, how am I going to do that? So. <laughs> <laughs> kind of some some Mike, popping some coming poppin through on from those on Jonathan's mic, uh, and now it's popping and locking as a result. Mm. Yeah. So we'll so, see. So yeah, my general better. advice is like this is a good game. Like a lot of the one page or two page RPGs are a great way to um, learn about DMing if you or GMing if you want to do that. And I. I mean, like, I just jumped in and did it one day, and I'm like, yes. And now I'm running some 5e, and I'm like, yes, I want to do more of that. So, <laughs> There's a big jump from one of those games to, like, 5e, though. I mean, you go from one page definitely. to, like, three books, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I definitely <laughs> right. did, like, I think I've done, like, eight or ten, like, like one-pagers. And I'm pretty reliant on, like, using a D and D Beyond because it's never been easier on D and D Beyond <laughs> to, like, create encounters right. and help, like, balance those encounters um, for the Five E stuff that I'm doing now. But it's definitely like been my like gateway to like building up to building my confidence. Yeah, there's a lot more content and like you have to go from two pages to three books, as Jonathan said. But it gives you more confidence in your ability to react to players, in your ability to make things up as you go. Yeah. <laughs> And that is most of being a GM. It's sure. just making things up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know Jonathan and I both talked about this before, and I've, I've learned a lot from my, my other DMs out there in the world, including Jonathan and Kayla both. Um, and definitely, like, the, the more I've done, the, the less, the shorter my notes get. It's more like I'm really bad with names. So I just need lists of names for any, like, potential NPCs. Half of my notes for this Hobbit Heist game were just like, if they run into a bunch of elves, here are a bunch of names. If they run into some people, here's some, because I'm real bad at yeah. names on the fly. One of my, one of my favorite <laughs> memes is, um, there's a scene in the office where he's like, um, who do you, who did you get your haircut by? And he's like, Barb or like Garber or something. He's like, it sounds like very similar to Barber. And his response is, it's a good thing he became a barber. Maybe that's why he became a barber then. And someone took that and did like, um, so what was the goblin's name? And it was like GM. And it was like Boblin. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, Boblin. that sounds really similar to Goblin. <laughs> He's like, good. Maybe that's why he became a goblin. <laughs> yeah. That's my life as a GM is making up a name and then immediately regretting it. Yeah, this my notes for this were like, here are some people they might run into, or some characters they might run into, here are the key things that those characters would tell them or do for them, and then the rest of it 
really just depended on the choices y'all made. And so it's good to, I, I mean, I guess on that yeah. point, since we're talking about things, you can like learn about GMing and stuff. My best situation when it comes up for like making up names off the top of my head has always been when the naming structure for the the race or the set of characters it, it, there's a structure to it and how their names work yeah um if you're if so what happens if uh, just like hey this human shows up what's their name i'm like jim and it's like the last three people we've met were named jim's like, crap um well the next one's human <laughs> like, yeah, the next one's human um <laughs> that's an inside joke for but us. like I, so for one of our <laughs> of us, three of us. one of our games i made up a a race of creatures known as foxlings and they are sort of humanoid foxlings and their naming structure, they follow a, a very sort of specific naming structure. It's usually two syllables for a first name. And then um, something kit, all their names end with kit with some word for it in front of it. And so like swift kit, white kit, red kit. Those have been so much easier to make up off the top of my head because I have to make sure I have to make sure anything I say follows the pattern first because that's how their names generally work. And um, and so I have to. I can't just say Jim, which not just not being able to say Jim alone <laughs> is like uh, a big benefit. Jim, Jim kit. Make Jim, rules Jim for kit. yourself that <laughs> yeah. Make, make sure make rules for yourself that prevent you from just saying the first thing that pops into your head. So Put yeah, as a template. brand new DM, yeah. just invent a custom race. Yeah, just do that. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's That's not all. the most practical yeah. advice, but I mean, you can still. No, I think. I mean, right have have me. a template. Yeah, you know, have a template. Yeah. yeah, or just do what yeah. Kira did and like just print a bunch of names out for things ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Literally, I just pre-generate yeah. like all kinds of names, and there are some great tools out there. Like uh, I use like my favorite fantasy name generator it's a good because one. it's expanding a all classic. the time. They're adding new races, new uh, pr- like it's not just for D and D. There's like real names too. So if you just want a name for something in a story that you're writing, so my issue um, with fantasy, so my issue with fantasy name generator though is that I don't like. Yeah like 70 percent of the names it generates <laughs> like they don't yeah, sound don't like, like names some of their mechanisms, like, yeah yeah I'm, some of their mechanisms yeah. i don't like so i i won't use it for certain things but like i went into like names for animals and went to wolf names and used that to generate the names for the wargs mm. hashtag spoiler um and that was how we got smoke okay. and tooth and shadow <laughs> and gruff cool um, names cool names much cooler than scraps <sighs> Ooh, and on that note <sighs> Let's log transition into the pearl and to what kick, other kick what out. other works of literature <laughs> yeah. do you think offer a similar experience to the work that was the focus of this session? Mm. Recommendations for other words. The similarian. That might have uh, similar. No, we're not going to do Cimmerillion. Uh, I am tempted to do some some stuff out of the rest of the books out of Lord of the Rings. Can we meet Tom Bombadil if we do Lord of the Rings 1? Yeah, that was the thing. thing, Like, I really want to use Tom Bombadil. I was wondering, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, "Mm." hmm. So I could definitely see doing some more on the heels of this that jumps into the next part of this story. Um, We've got a suggestion in the chat. Chronicles of Narnia. That would definitely definitely be a good one. I've considered that as well because my my interest in children's lit and sort of these kinds of tales. Um, uh, yeah, any other kinds of like media that someone who was just interested in The Hobbit might pursue? Any recommendations? I mean, there? at the core of it, like J.R.R. Tolkien's books are like so entrenched in what like traditional fantasy <laughs> is. Like, yeah, that's. <laughs> I, I just saw the comment in the chat. I'll comment come back to that in a second. Yep. But like, really, a, a lot land of land. anything that falls into that like medieval fantasy like styling would would give you a similar vein, mostly because it's all sort of descended from here. Yeah, I mean, you could take some medieval literature. You could do, you know, I mean, it would be, I would be interesting to do Beowulf, Chaucer's like Canterbury Tales. <laughs> 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 Well, I was, or like I was thinking um, the story of the Green Knight or sort of any of the Arthurian legends you could play. There, is a, along. there is a new movie coming out about the Green Knight. Did you not see the trailer? It came out like yesterday or two yeah. days ago. It's a weird. Yeah, we could, we could do a Merlin it's story. So we had a wizard who actually did something rather than. I mean, that's my anyway, that's my but... vote. Uh, <laughs> yes. Can can I play an, uh, like. I want you to play Chronicles of Narnia, but I'm not a player, mm-hmm. but I just pop in to be Aslan. <laughs> uh, but as okay. scraps. We can, 
Oh my that's, god. We had to do a little I would, I that would, would be ask, hilarious. Oh my god. No, like you just I show hate up it so at the much. end of it. We do the first Everyone, <laughs> I have declared <laughs> that you shall all from now on be friends with each other and with Aslan. So, so, so speak of the, so speak of the Jesus, the Jesus lion. <laughs> wow. I mean, you oh don't read Chronicles of Narnia without knowing that Aslan is the Jesus lion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I didn't read other, Chronicles. Other of Wait, sorry, what? Yeah, sorry, what was that? I didn't mm. read it. I started it and I never finished it. It's, it's like a bunch of books. I haven't read it either. I read, I think, oh, really? most of the first yes. book. But, oh, okay. You haven't um, read The Lion with the Witch in the Wardrobe? That's not a long book. I read part of it and I gave up. They're all very short. They're all pretty. Yeah. But they get they get so boring. They do. That's, absolute, yeah. that's absolutely <laughs> true. They get very um, dry, I would say the word is. Less, I think, less I think things the, happen. I read enough more... of it to pass the accelerated reader test. <laughs> See, I read a lot of Redwall <laughs> books to read to pass the accelerated reader test because they gave you like so. Redwall would be a lot Redwall would be so much be fun, but I think we'd have to do Mouse Guard or something like that. That'd be a lot of fun to do with it since it's basically Redwall the I mean, TTRPG. I would love. I would love to do Watership Down, but I think it's way too depressing to be a honey heist. It's going to have to be yeah, <laughs> something we, way more serious. It was like Hulu or Netflix was like. Hey, you watched this like lighthearted show. You know what's similar to that? Watership Down. I was like, no, it's not. And we were like, that. We watched Hilda, right. the Netflix show Hilda, which is is you know like a children's animated show. It's an excellent show if you haven't watched it. But um, we were like looking through recommendations for like people who liked Hilda would also like. And I was like, I don't think Watership Down is an appropriate alternative to this like children's animated no, the, show the middle ground on that would be an amazing book called uh tail chaser song which is kind of like watership down but for cats and it's a lot less depressing but yeah mm. <laughs> sounds like the chat's uh, upset our, oh, no. you our have, apologies you to the audience chats. um for the lack of narnians uh here uh we'll work on it you know Secret of Nim. Another is there a, adaptation ooh. suggestion could be Secret of Nim. Is there a, yeah, is Secret of Nim based on a book? Yes. Oh. It is. is the book as depressing so. as the movie? Don't know. Never read it. Chat. Mm. <laughs> never seen the movie. <laughs> can we get a like it? <laughs> like, yeah. like the movie. Chat weighing in. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is the, the movie starts with like this little mouse who's like son's dying of pneumonia oh. or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's like like, well, so there's a whole thing about Don Bluth and his movies and how depressing yeah, they all yes. are, and it's like let's traumatize children. Um, right? Isn't that what all children's literature is? John? I mean, we don't have time for. This well, but this was that's but this was an animated that's animated form. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still Watership Down is technically animated and technically yeah. a children's story. <laughs> it's just it's tricky. It's Since we're talking about other yeah. media, I just want to implore everyone to watch at least a portion of the Lord of the Rings movie that came out before, like the main ones that you know, because it's just it's just the history. It's like a chef's kiss moment of history of animation. Um, oh, chat has provided us more intel on the book title. Mrs. Frisbee. Yeah, and Mrs. The rats Frisbee. Yeah. I there we go. That. So, thank you, chat. For sure. <laughs> Um, what about upcoming things uh, that people are excited for? So we've got one more session of Roll Call, roll call. for the uh, the sequel to our Sherlock Holmes adventure. Um, and that'll be two weeks from today. Yep. But Jonathan, there's not any more uh, role of play. What are we going to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, not. it's coming back eventually. Yeah, it is coming back. You said back. that like right. it's never coming Industry. back. Let's be clear. Before in, you talk about new stuff. Later. In the fall, yes. the fall, we will have the role of play. It will return. Um, we will probably be in person filming somewhere in Newman Library, playing games and stuff. It'll be lots of fun. Um, in the meantime. We'll have dice cam. Are we going to have a dice cam? We will have a dice cam. Uh, we'll have all of these glorious things that we've wanted for a while, and um, that's <laughs> going to be great. In the meantime, over the summer, since we most of the people have left campus and it's mostly just us in the library, what we're going to do is we are going to play through Walden the game. Um, so <laughs> one of us will play, probably me, and we'll have some people who are also commenting on the game and chatting and 
Um, Transcendentalists, t- t- Transcendentalists. We may be right. playing yeah. also. We Live may be from... playing along with, but we won't be streaming our play sessions. You know. Yeah. So we'll we'll stream one yeah. of the play sessions. Other people might play as well. We'll see. Awesome. Um, I'm excited about this. Yeah. And so that. Uh, <laughs> do you just well, walk... question from chat? That's. <laughs> Do you just walk around the no, pond and observe no spoilers. things and think? No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> please. No spoilers. Um, I believe you yeah, got to tune in to find, out. find out. The one thing I do believe you do play as Thoreau. Like when yeah, you do. playing you the play game, you play as Thoreau. Yes. And this yeah. was made by I'm gonna get the I get the school uh, wrong university. every single time. It's university it's one of the US, Southern US, California Games Lab. I think, so. I think that's correct. USC Games I Lab. Know. I think that's right. Well, we'll we'll have all that information then. I'm pretty I'm sure it's USC. That while, well. while we get this up. <laughs> right. I'm very yes. excited at the prospect of someone like just narrating in some existential way Jonathan's playthrough. You mean me narrating my own playthrough in an existential? <laughs> no, I want other people oh, to okay. do it. We need to do this all a mystery science three thousand. Like that. Was, that is probably I mean, how to be, be set providing up. Providing some commentary. Well, you know. I am I am 100% down for so this So it will likely be structured with like the game capture in the center and like whoever's playing will be like their cam face cam will be in the center. But we'll have two other people on either side. So I mean and will they be is... like green screened and reversed and like in shadow so it does look exactly like Mr. Science I Theater? mean if we can figure out the logistics of that I'm fine with it. <laughs> Just, just flip us all. We just seems doable. just everybody has to take a photo of themselves from behind. We'll uh, outline and shadow out, and we'll just put that over it, and then on we'll the just side. have their mics. Should I wear a fancy hat? I mean, it would make you more uh, distinguishable. I want to make a distinct silhouette. Yeah, yeah, because the robots have very distinct silhouettes. So. Yeah. Also, we have to have a couple versions where sometimes sure. your hands up in the air pointing at something. That's fair. I like the Alice and I both I know, that it was good, it was like, good. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yes, that is what we will... So that is is an exciting thing that we'll be starting next week mm-hmm. at the end of the oh. week, right? In it our normal soon. role of play soon. time slot. Yep. But um, uh, And we'll be running for an indeterminate amount of time. Yeah. However, However long, long it takes to play, to play the game, question mark? probably. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we if we so. end up like beating the game, I don't know. Do you beat Walden? <laughs> I think it has a set story. I think you just coexist. <laughs> I mean, we'll at a certain point, at a certain point, you've done everything, and you just you go out and you reach Nirvana. I think. Um, yeah, coexist <laughs> until you reach Nirvana. Um, well, we'll play it. We'll play until either we can't play anymore, or uh, uh, or we run out of time in the summer, and, and our students are coming back. <laughs> One so. of those two things. Yeah. And yeah, and we are already planning. We've already mentioned some things on Roll of Play and on Roll Call for things for the fall, but we're planning out our schedule. So if you out there, viewers, have suggestions, we would love to hear them. If you want, you can email us at rolloofplay g at vt.edu, uh, or you can visit our link in the chat, bit.ly forward slash Roll of Play with capital R and capital P. Um, to share what you'd be interested in seeing, uh, what game or what like game systems you think it'd be cool for us to explore, what stories or books from, you know, school or your childhood or your general interests that you think it would be cool to explore, you know, whatever. Oh, we should mention whatever Archival, you share. Archival Adventures will still be taking place over the summer. Yes. So on Wednesday, we'll have right. some, some Wednesday afternoon. And we may add some other programming. There certainly will be new programming yeah. in the fall, but stay tuned. We'll we'll update that yeah. as we can. We've got some plans for potentially in the summer. We just got to see if they pan out. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. But I mean, yeah. for the fall, as we transition back into the building, there will be. Uh, a variety of programming options that open yeah. up more in the fall. Yeah. We've got, we've already started looking at some works that we intend to take on. And we're also thinking about experimenting with some like series, which you've probably heard us talking about. Um, I still am eventually going to run a seven part series based on the dark tower series. Eventually yes. um, <laughs> the, the sort of secret, but not so secret project that I've also been working on would be a series of probably at least five games based on Nausicaa of the Valley of the wind which people might respond and be like, hey, Jonathan, isn't that a movie? My response is yes, but it started as a manga, a very long graphic novel, uh, 
and that is what it's uh, this and, and and then legitimately it will be based on that so there will be a lot of stuff that's dealt with and explored that was never introduced in the movie and never dealt with in the movie but that will be our maybe our first foray into studio ghibli-esque role-playing adventure nice if we do have a stay, plus one to Dark yeah. Tower. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, the there's chat. a plus one to Dark Tower. Yeah. If people stay on me, I will work on a little scheme for fall myself. Mm. <laughs> there's time. There's plenty of time. Yeah. We say that. And then, and then let you blink and it's August. Like, I have not put any of this together. <laughs> Stop bumming me out talking about how August is going to be here in no time. I have a, like a long list of things that needs to be done before then. We all do. <laughs> yeah. It's true. But if you, our viewers, have suggestions, we would love to hear them. Um, And if you uh, generally have uh, thoughts about programming that maybe you've seen other libraries do uh, that you would be interested in having us explore, you can make those suggestions as well. We will have several new spaces open in Newman Library in Blacksburg, Virginia come uh, the fall. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of potentials for us to collaborate and to explore some of those spaces potentially on Twitch. So if you've got interests, tell us about them. We'll definitely have some (laughs) of that stuff up. It'll be fun. Definitely have some prototyping. If you would like to play related content for the fall. uh, Yes, we will have currently we have a 3d printing a 3d design studio but opening in the fall will be a full prototyping studio so there are some some ideas circling around that for some programming designed for makers of various types Uh, but if you want to join us uh, and you are either part of the virginia tech community or associated with libraries in some way or a student faculty or staff member at Virginia Tech specifically, uh, we would love for you to reach out to get involved. And I think with that, are we raiding anyone Let this me evening? Let's see. We will absolutely raid someone. <laughs> uh, let's raid a uh, Penny Arcade someone. as they are playing Valheim, Ooh. which is kind of Walden-esque, you know. Oh. Uh, definitely got some good... Um, is it? No. I think it's a little more Beowulf. <laughs> I think it's a little <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, that's a little more Beowulf. That uh, that actually is very Beowulf. That is true. Um, So, yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, thank you to all of our panelists. And thank you to all of our viewers for joining us this afternoon. And we will see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.